Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Nav's Effect Podcast. I am your host, Naveen Ganglani. So, a couple of things before we get to today's podcast. We will have two parts to the podcast. First, I invited some friends over to talk about the UP Fighting Maroons' recent win against the NU Bulldogs in the UAAP Season 86 Men's Basketball Tournament. UP now 3-0 to start their campaign this UAAP season. Now, after that, I also invite a very special guest to talk about something non-sports related, non-video games related, non-TV related. It's going to be something out of the ordinary, but something that I think is very interesting. It is part of my new goal to bring new topics to this podcast, to talk about different conversations that I feel would interest many of the listeners and other people out there. So do tune in for that as well. But before we begin, a short word from our sponsor, The Cleaning Coach. When it comes to cleaning a home or office, most people just know the basics. Mopping the floor, wiping off dust and dirt is pretty standard. While all that can make a place look clean, it doesn't mean it is clean. Making a place truly clean and virus-free requires a professional help. That's where The Cleaning Coach comes in. The Cleaning Coach provides outstanding general cleaning, commercial cleaning, post-construction cleanup, upholstery cleaning, floor, carpet cleaning, aircon cleaning, and disinfection at a very reasonable price. The cleaning coach and his team will do all the scrubbing, dusting, polishing, disinfecting, and sanitizing, so you won't have to. Making your place look clean that you can also smell and feel, you will experience the difference. Now that's stress-free cleaning to a better normal, done professionally by the cleaning coach. Contact the cleaning coach today to learn more. Okay, we are in the podcast now, and I am joined by two friends who I think safe to say you can call them diehard UP Fighting Maroons fans. I am joined by Miles Devesa and Mitch Lauretta. Now we are going to discuss the UP Maroons dominant 78 to 60 victory over the NU Bulldogs, which took place Saturday at the Smart Araneta Coliseum. We are recording this on a Sunday. And you know, when I entered that game, the NUUP game, I was very interested to see how it would play out because I felt that UP and NU were the two most impressive teams so far in the first week, half week of the UAAP season. And then you got off to a great start. They built an early lead, but UP slowly and surely with their defense, settled down in the offense, came back, won the game, dominated in the third quarter, Best player of the contest was Francis LeBron Lopez with 14 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists, a plus 34 in only 24 minutes of action. But it was a balanced effort from the Fighting Maroons. Reigning MVP Malik Diouf that 12 points, 13 rebounds. He was a plus 21 in the contest. CJ Cancinum, 12 points, plus 20 in 22 minutes. Harold Alarcon, 10 points. In 17 minutes, JD Kagulangan with 8 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists. You all know what the drift is right now. UP, balanced effort, great win. So let's start with you, Miles. What impressed you the most about UP's victory over NU? Yes, uh, what impressed me the most uh, about UP's uh, victory against you was the little things, no? Uh, I don't... Uh, have the statistics with me right now, although I do know that UP actually committed more turnovers than than NU did. But despite that, uh, UP had the advantage in fast break points, uh, which is a testament to two things. You know, uh, first is that uh, UP uh, can generate uh, fast breaks even off of defensive rebounds. You know, uh, we we've seen plays where uh, JD or um, um, the 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 uh, uh, Jan Jan no they they were up up and running right after a defensive rebound uh trying to push the pace trying to score quick points every time uh and also that uh the other side of the coin is that whenever uh UP turns the ball over they run back to defend the fast break and, and that prevents NU from capitalizing on those UP turnovers and uh that says a lot about the uh about the discipline they've shown no uh, I think that um. In general, not just for this game, uh, UP's, uh, this version of UP uh, so far looks like the most disciplined uh, version of UP, uh, both on offense and on defense. 
yeah, to your point, looking at the other statistics right now in UPs, what I call the pretty dominant when UP led by as much as 18 points, even if they trailed by 9 points early in the game. 19 fast break points to NU's 8. Starter points is pretty even. Points off turnovers, 14 for UP, 9 for NU. Points in the paint, both teams pretty even. Second chance points, 15 to 9 for UP. UP also is better in terms of their bench points and contested field goals. Now, to your point, UP had 16 turnovers and you had 15. So to some degree, you could say that the turnover battle was pretty balanced. But in the rebounding department, 44 to 35 in favor of the Fighting Maroons. And those are two statistics I typically look at in college basketball because I feel rebounds and turnovers, that really dictates how many possessions you have in a game. Right, So from this alone, UP got multiple possessions, more than NU. 61 field goal attempts for UP, 60 for NU. So that was pretty even to some degree. Though. Free throws, they were pretty even. But NU, 1 of 13 from downtown. UP made 6 shots from 3-point range. Overall, just 36.7% for NU, 45.9% for, for the Fighting Maroons. Mitch... You've been following UP this whole season too. You've been following the team for a while. Early in the season, three games in, what makes this UP squad different from the UP teams of the last two seasons? Well, actually, I think I can only speak for this this season because I only really saw all of the preseason and uh, the UAAP. So I think compared to the preseason, I'm seeing a lot more ball movement. And I see that the players are sharing the ball a lot more. Um, no one's trying to be the hero. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And by the way, before we continue, I should just shout out the UP women's basketball team as well. They just beat National University to start their season with a 3-0 record. So both men's and women's squad of UP basketball are in the early stages of this tournament really doing well. So major props to both of them. There are some promising signs right now in terms of UP's athletic system. Of course, Coach Bo Perisol, Director Bo Perisol, he has many ranks, many um titles right now. He but he's taking charge of the sports system and they're trying to change it up. But back to the Fighting Maroons, this is the deepest team in the UAAP. This is the best fast breaking team in the UAAP. And early on, I feel like when you talk about a squad that you say, okay. You need a defensive stop. Which squad do you trust the most to pull out that stop? Right now, UP to me is the answer. It's easy when you have someone like Malik Diouf manning the paint, rebounding, can dribble a bit too, can create for others as well. He's an underrated passer. And then in terms of fast breaks, getting out on the court, quick, easy two points, three on two breaks, four on three breaks, two on one, this team is the deadliest team in the UAP with Francis LeBron Lopez running the break, CJ Cancino spreading the floor for three, Harold Alarcon, JT Kagulangan being a point guard, Felicilda has been great, Raylan Torres has been great, and some of the standout new players like Luis Pablo, Mark Belmonte, Seven Gagate, you know, they haven't even exactly received a ton of minutes yet. And that's because the rest of the squad, there are many players who can contrib- contribute different games. Different quarters. Jerry Abaniano had eight points yesterday. Uh, Raylan Torres, eight points as well. I, like we mentioned, Kagulangan, eight, six, and five. Safe to say, right now, I think UP is the best team in the UAP. Now, it is early. It's We're about, we're not even like one fourth into the elimination round yet. And we still have to see UP take on LaSalle and Ateneo. But I felt NU entering this season was a contender for the championship. And that was only strengthened by the way NU played against Ateneo. Now, Ateneo is also going through some growing pains, but they're still pretty good. They did beat LaSalle. And the way UP turned that game around, just took over in the third quarter, made it a non-contest, it's telling that I feel right now at least they have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. Miles, I know you're a diehard UP fan, but looking at it from an objective perspective, I know that you tend to agree with that. Yes, uh, I, I tend to agree with that. I do want to make uh, certain reservations because, again, our sample size here is just 
uh, three games coming in, no? However, three games is enough to say that there's a certain separation from the rest of the field, no? Uh, of course, the challenge now for UP is uh, maintaining that. However, no, uh, if, if you notice uh, certain teams in the UAAP, the, the great ones, the really great ones, have this uh, switch that they can, can turn on anytime. Uh, and for UP, it's their defense, no? As long as, uh, even when their shots are not falling in, that, that defense is on. And then, and when that defense starts getting turnovers no, out of the opponents, they, they punish those opponents right away because they have the athleticism to run and, and make points out of those turnovers. And what's also nice to know about UP, you know, the little things. I don't think there's a certain gimmick uh, to what UP is doing. It's not like a fancy press like the other teams are doing. It's also not, you know, like the just face your man, uh, clean defense type of gimmick, no? Uh, like, like I think what the Norman Black teams were doing uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, it's more of UP using uh, a lot its quickness and depth to uh, run, to try to force players to run throughout the court. And uh, those stocky guards are just hard to get by on the drives. And then those lengthy forwards are really good in closing out those three-point shots. Uh, I think UP last season was the best defensive team in uh, in defending the three. No? And I think this season, they're on, on track to still be that uh, best team in terms of defending the three-pointer because of all the lengths that they have. And even Malik Diouf, they, they can uh, gamble with Malik Diouf uh, trying to close out on the shooters because they still have guys like Belmonte uh, manning the paint, no? trying to hold the court inside uh, just in case that gamble doesn't turn out well. Right. I agree with those points. Now, there's also a factor here behind the scenes in terms of team chemistry and how the team is coming together. And Mitch, I know you've spent some time getting to know maybe not exactly the players, but key members of the team at least, having an idea of how team chemistry developed and progressed entering this UAP season. So behind the scenes... You know, in terms of team chemistry, team building, camaraderie, is there something special about this current UP squad? Well, we do know that, that uh, most of the team members are the science, and I think they gel a lot because uh, they can communicate well. I mean, even the non Visayan members actually have learned to speak Visaya because of hanging around together. And um, from what I know, well, I'm not, I'm not supposed to, I don't know if I'm supposed to know this, but we do know is that they're living together in a house. Mm. So that contributes to them gelling better together. I mean, they're like practically family. They, they live in one house. Well, most of them do live in one house. So they're like brothers, like actual brothers. And also they hang around a lot together. Uh, they go out a lot together. They do their TikToks together. They they dance and stuff. So yeah, I can see that really gelling well together. Correct. And I believe they stay at University Hotel. If I'm not, I'm not sure if that's still where they stay, but a lot of them do board at the University Hotel. You're right about the team bonding too. I did get to go to one UP practice before the season started, and the chemistry within now. Take note also, like it is for all teams, there is competition in the team for minutes. When you have so many talented players in a team, so many talented recruits, guys used to getting a lot of playing time and usage on the court, then there is that natural competitive feel with showing, okay, I want to play at least like 15 minutes a game, you know, get maybe a few shots up. But so far, no complaints. The young guys know their roles. The young guys knew coming in that they wouldn't play right away, but they wanted to be part of this roster. And like you said, you know, the Visayan aspect of it, very true. In fact, Jared Bahai, he has said on the record that's probably the biggest reason why he went to UP. And not only because his teammates were Visayan, but also because the management that he met, members of the squad, he was able to relate with them in terms of Filipino roots. So, Despite everything we said, it's still early in the season. And I'm particularly looking forward to how UP will do against La Salle and Ateneo. By the time they face Ateneo, I feel Ateneo will have improved as a roster. The Ateneo team they will face at the end of the first round isn't the same Ateneo team that right now is trying to figure out a rotation, trying to figure out late game execution. And that will be a good challenge for them. And in terms of facing La Salle, we know the challenges La Salle has when it comes to consistency. 
consistency and composure and execution, especially in the half court. But we also know that LaSalle's length, LaSalle's defense, and LaSalle's, I don't know what the exact term for it, but LaSalle's ability to go on these short runs uh, occasionally will be a challenge for UP as well. Although, like I said, short sample size and everything, given what we've seen so far, if you had to name a number one team in the league right now, very premature, very early, I would say it's UP. One last topic I want to bring up before I let you both go is CJ Cancino. Now, it's so funny because after the first game, CJ apologized for the over-celebrating and the over-aggressiveness. But in the second and third game of UP, he's still been, you know, there playing up to the crowd, playing up to the the atmosphere of the UAAP games. And I don't mind it at all, number one, because it is CJ's last season. This is probably going to be the best version of CJ Cancino we're going to see in the UAAP. So far, his three-point shooting looks better. I think that his pull-up game has improved. He's the leader of this, this team. He, he doesn't look actively for shots. And I love how he is showing his passion, his excitement, because he's a player who's been injured multiple times. He's a player who's been through a lot in his college career. And to see that joy, to see that collegiate spirit, that joy to be on the court, to just play basketball, I think it doesn't only make watching this team more exciting. I think that that energy is infectious in the whole team too. I think when the other players see CJ celebrating that way, showing off that spirit, it's hard to explain, but it just brings this positive energy and that really helps propel the team. What do you both think? Let's start with you, Mitch. Yeah, about CJ. Yeah, as he said, he's been through a lot. He's had two injuries. Um, Sad to say his mom died uh, recently and he's had to overcome a lot. So to see him being able to celebrate that way on the court is just really inspiring. And I don't take it against him for him to want to show his joy off. Like, uh, if he shoots a basket, does his pow, 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 pow thing, I mean, like, hey, it, it's just a celebration. It's nothing arrogant or obnoxious to me. Right. Miles, how about you? I, I agree. You know, I, I totally agree. As a matter of fact, if you notice, he's been playing like a well, well-oiled machine, no? at least for the last three games. And uh, the, the temptation when you're playing so efficiently is that you you treat everything uh, as if you're going through the motions. No? And CJ being there, injecting that electric emotion no? In, into the game, that really helps a lot because UP is going to need that, especially when they will now go... Uh, up against the other preseason favorites no, that they have yet to face, uh, which are LaSalle and Ateneo. CJ is showing every bit why he is the captain. Uh, the Puso is there. You see that uh, he's he's not only is he proud that uh, he's overcome that injury, but he's also proud of the reinvention of his game. Uh, we've seen him in high school. He used to dominate the stat sheet, though, uh, but, but, but with his injury uh, limiting uh, his athleticism, he's reinvented his game. Uh, to become a much better three-point shooter. In, in this past three games, he shot 11 out of 20, you know, and, and that's a lot. That's uh, more than 50%. And, you know, as a uh, three-point shooter, uh, if you're above 30, in, if you're in the high 30s, you're, you already have a good clip. But going three games uh, at the 50% range, no, uh, that's phenomenal. Of course, the challenge now will be uh, the, the other teams will now have to check uh, his three-point shooting, and we'll now have to see how he can respond to the challenge, you know, how to attack those closeouts and uh, use uh, his gravity you know, to make his teammates better. I think we've, we've seen glimpses of that. Sina Alarcon and Torres uh, have already started to score more you know, uh, in, in these past few games. And I'm really excited for CJ. I, I would love for him to win this championship per UP this season. Well, I think it would be very interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out. And I'm curious to see how else UP keeps going the rest of the first round. Will this be something that is consistent and keeps building up? Or will we see a game where maybe they have a letdown? Perhaps they get caught off guard by a team. In the remaining schedule, like I said, they have Ateneo, they have LaSalle. If I'm not mistaken, they have FEU coming up for the Wednesday game. And there's one more 
team. I don't think they faced UST yet as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to double check the schedule, but then those are the teams I believe they're yet to face. So let's see how it goes. Miles and Mitch, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. And let's see how the rest of the season plays out. It's been exciting so far. We've had some blowouts. We've also had some close games. We've had the game winner already, a couple of overtime games. And I feel like the UAP season is just really getting started. So thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Nelson Mitch. Attention sports enthusiasts and loyal Ateneo fans. The peak of excitement may have settled after the UAAP season, but your support for Team Ateneo should never waver. Show your unwavering spirit by proudly donning your favorite Get Blued merchandise. We have amazing news for you. You can now find the most extensive selection of authentic Ateneo gear at both Shopee Mall and Laz Mall. Gear up and embrace the blue and white pride with Get Blued Stop Notch Apparel. And remember, always buy original. LaSalle fans and animal supporters, the crown is back in Taft. Now is the best time to secure the most incredible DLSU merchandise in the market to celebrate the Lady Spikers title conquest of Season 85. Green Blooded Championship t-shirt is something you do not want to miss out on. It comes in three different colors with the name of each champion spiker on the back, names that will be remembered forever. What better way to celebrate this unforgettable season? So visit Green Blooded on Shopee now and show off your animal spirit. Okay, we're back now for the second part of this podcast episode. And just to give some background about what we're going to do here, I'm going to introduce a new concept where I decide to bring other topics to this podcast that's not just focused on sports or focused on the usual coverages I provide. And I thought, well, what better way to start this new, let's say, um, special? No, what better way to start this new part? story of this podcast than to bring my wife Karina here to discuss about her passions which is astrology among others now before we begin many of you listeners perhaps your first notion or your first thought about astrology like it was for me back in the day was reading horoscopes on a newspaper or an online website or nowadays in social media platforms okay like for example I'm a Scorpio and so this is what you have in store for Scorpio for the next year. Oh, it says I'm going to achieve a lot of success. Great. A few months later, not a lot of success. I'm wondering what the hell happened, right? So basic, that's the basic perhaps um, idea that many people have when it comes to astrology. But Karina here has actually made astrology her career, studying what it's about, studying birth charts, how you have multiple signs in your birth chart. Beyond just the usual astrological zodiac sign that many people assume they have. But I'm no expert on this. She is. So I am going to let her talk about it. Welcome. Um, I'm so used to calling you babe. But here I'm going to have to call you Karina probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? Why don't you share the story about how you got into astrology? And what? is the difference between what astrology actually is compared to what people generally perceive it to be? Hmm. Okay, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having me, all of Naveen's listeners. It is my pleasure and honor to be here. Um, okay, okay. A long time. <laughs> no, I'm serious. A long time ago, we talked about how he would have me on for his 100th episode. And a big part of me was like, he's just saying that. So to be here for 101, I feel. <laughs> I really feel so happy to be here. Okay. By so, the way, you were going to be on the 100. And then I told you we would record at like 3 in the morning after we went out for a birthday party. And you and I both decided, yeah, maybe 101 would be okay. Not too bad. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I'd rather be recording on a Sunday afternoon than a Thursday, a Wednesday uh, <laughs> at like 3 a.m. Anyway, so how I got into astrology is I was working a job that I didn't necessarily enjoy doing accounting, which is not my passion at all, being a creative. 
And I knew that there was just more and I had to do more and know more and learn more. And I don't know exactly how, but something switched in me and I was like, hey, if if like the moon, if the moon has an effect on the sea and if it makes either if it makes tides either high tide or low tide then it also has to have an effect on our bodies because our body is made up of so many percent water like mostly water in fact um so if the moon has an effect on us and on the sea then of course other floating objects that surround our planet would also kind of have an effect on what's going on so that got me curious and that got me diving deeper. And then I studied my astro chart and then I would send Naveen here. Um, it's so weird calling you Naveen because I usually call you Nuala. Um, <laughs> so I would send um, Naveen all of what I was finding for myself as well as for him. And every time I sent him something and he was like, oh yeah, this totally makes sense. It also made more sense for me because I was like, oh, I'm not crazy. I'm not just telling myself it makes sense. You think it makes sense for you as well. And then I started reading about our astrology together because I am a Leo and you are a Scorpio and anybody that has studied astrology would know that those form a square, which is a challenging aspect. But then it's a challenging aspect that when you find a different perspective, it's actually so much more playful and so much more fun. So this is the level to which I've gone into understanding astrology way further than just your zodiac sign or your horoscope. But the relationship that the planets make with each other and how that plays out in our daily lives and how we can actually take advantage of it and harness it rather than become victim to it. So that's a little bit of how I started. Now, the way I understand it, which is different from how everybody probably understands it, is we understand it as one sign. You know, I was born in August. I was born on August 9th, so I'm a Leo. That's how we understand it. You were born in October, so you're a Scorpio. But then that's actually just one very tiny part of the story. Well, yes, the sun is the brightest planet in the sky. And so it's a big part of us. But then there is also the fact that the moon was somewhere when you were born. You know, Mars was somewhere, Mercury was somewhere, Venus was somewhere. Um, so every planet was somewhere in the sky when you were born. And all of these planets tell you a different part of your personality. So the sun, because again, it's it's like the brightest part. It talks about your radiance and your vitality. Whereas the moon, for example, since it only comes out at night, it talks about your emotional your emotional needs your inner world whereas venus talks about how you love how you want to be loved mars talks about action so everything talks about something different and so the more we know about our astrology and the different planetary placements the more we understand about ourselves and the more we're given permission to be who we really are and that's the biggest one for me like it's a permission slip for authenticity yeah so, you know, many people also assume when it comes to astrology or reading what their birth charts say about them, they feel that, okay, for instance, I'm a Leo and it says on astrological studies that, hey, Leos, they like thinking about themselves, they're prideful, they're very um me-centered, but that's not necessarily true. It depends on how you read it, the perspective of which you read it. And you've told me this too multiple times where it's more of a guide than it is an explanation of who you are as a person. Definitely, yes, it is a guide. I like to look at it as a map. So if you're looking at your own chart, it's a map to you. But if you're looking at the astrology for right now, then it's a map to understand the current times. It's almost like a weather report. But instead of a weather report, it's an astrology report. Now, in terms of what you were saying, every single sign. So first thing, all of us have every single sign in our chart because this is planet Earth. OK, this is planet Earth in the middle and we are surrounded by sky. It's not that sky is only above us. We're a floating planet. So we're surrounded by sky. And thus this sky surrounding us has been made into a circle. Think of a pie graph. OK, mm. think of a pie or a pizza. Think of a pizza. This pizza has been cut into 12 slices. OK, mm -hmm. and each slice has a number from one to 12. And each slice also has an owner, 
Okay, so for example, the first house belongs to Aries. Don't touch that pizza because that's Aries' pizza. Second house is Taurus. Third house is Gemini. And it goes on. And so when we were born, the planets are in one of these signs. And every, so we all have all the signs. And even if you don't have a planet in that sign, it still plays out in some aspect of your personality. Each sign has a lower, a neutral, and a higher octave. So Leo, if it's operating from a place of anger, from a place of stress, if it's not aware or conscious of its actions, then that can look like pride and ego and me, 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 because it's a fire sign and fire signs are very passionate about whatever they're passionate about. But then a middle vibe Leo, it's ruled by the sun. So Leo is about like radiating their light and empowering other people to radiate their light as well. So middle vibe, the Leo has learned, okay, it's not all about me. I can shine a spotlight on other people as well. And then higher vibe Leo is really just offering a stage for more people to shine their light rather than being me, me, me. It's like, oh, I want you to express. I want to hear about you. So every sign has a lower, middle, higher vibe. So if you're not resonating with a horoscope or something that's said, it's just one little perspective of somebody decoding that astrology. Maybe another astrologer will decode it in a way that makes more sense to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Now, you said that there are different planets in different signs when we are born. So there are different combinations you can think of in particular. When you try to... For those who have not seen their birth charts, right? For example, those who have yeah. not. And to see your birth charts, you need the time you were born, your birthday. Um, basically, what's on your birth certificate. Now, birth date, date, place, and time. Date, place, and time. Yeah. So let's give an example. For example, let's say when you were born, the planet Neptune was in, um, let's say, Capricorn. What does that mean? With the planets, we have something called personal planets. Yeah. And then we have something called interpersonal planets. Interpersonal planets are also known as generational planets. So for a long time, like those planets stay in the same sign. So say, perfect, actually, that you said Neptune and Capricorn, because that's where we have Neptune. And it stays for a long, like, I can't tell you the exact number of the years. It's not coming to me right now, but maybe 13 to 15 um, so it's a long time. And so the personal planets are Venus, Mars, Mercury. These will have a bigger effect in your daily life. But then something like Neptune, it's more generational and Neptune and Capricorn. So let's break it down. Neptune is the planet of dreaminess, spirituality, can also look like escapism. Neptune is also a planet of creativity and of media any addictive tendencies because it's nebulous, you know, it's big, it's full of illusion and also disillusion. So that's a little bit of Neptune. And then when we put it in Capricorn, Capricorn is all about systems and structures that worked once upon a time. Okay, because okay. it's ruled by Saturn. And so Neptune, uh, Capricorn is all about like a structured way of being, loves goals, loves understanding where they're going. Putting Neptune in Capricorn, I wouldn't imagine that Neptune likes it a lot in Capricorn because Neptune is very dreamy and like, la, 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 where Capricorn's like, Neptune, come on, can we just come up with a damn plan? Mm -hmm. And so that looks like maybe not being sure about how to create structure in your daily life. Or maybe it looks like adding a dreaminess to reality. It could look like making money nebulous because th that there's so much that can be said from that. Okay. Now, you have coached people with astrology as the basis of the coaching fundamentals. So some people might, at first, the reaction would be, oh, that's very interesting. That's not something you hear every day, you know, out of the ordinary. When you go deeper, though, for any human being, we have a certain set of coaching that we live by. Some people are coached by their parents and how they go by life. Some people are coached by their mentors or their bosses. Basketball players are coached by their actual basketball coaches. Some people are coached online, you know, whether that's Google or that's online coaching from another mentor 
or some people are coached with self-help books, philosophical books. So we have different forms of coaching in our lives that get us through our daily adventures and tasks and jobs. What is the benefit of being coached by astrology? And from your experience coaching people through astrology, how has astrology helped them in terms of how they go about their daily lives? So my favorite part about astrology and this question is whether we know it or not, we are living based on the astrology. The time movies are released are perfect for the seasons that we're in. The time is that, for example, we're feeling like staying at home and not going anywhere. Oh, guess what? The moon is actually in Cancer or in Taurus and we want to stay home. Mm. So the thing is, we're all already living by our astrology, but just having it reflected back by someone that understands astrology, I think that's where it's all a game changer. Because, for example, I'm going to put it in terms of you so that you understand it better as well. For example, the moon is moving through Capricorn. And uh, we know that Capricorn is in your first house, right? Right. My rising my rising sign, if I'm not mistaken. Your yeah. rising sign. And your rising sign is basically how you present yourself to the world, your self-image, you know, how you show up, how people see you. And so if the moon is in Capricorn, I wouldn't be surprised if you're like, oh, baby, no, I wrote a bunch of things on my to-do list and I actually got them all done. You know, mm. that's very Capricorn. So what I do is I coach women through, or men, but I coach women primarily, and that's what I specialize in, through WhatsApp voice notes. And they tell me what's going on in their lives. And I kind of reflect back how that's so in line with the astrology. And then I give them ideas of what's coming up so that they can plan, because like I told you, it's like a weather report. So whether you were told or not that it's raining, um, when you go outside and it's raining, it's raining. Mm. You know what I mean? So whether or not you're informed of the astrology, that energy is playing out. So I like to think of it as a language and I like to think of it as an art. It's a language because when you learn to decode it, you're able to, again, harness it and plan your days according to it. You're able to do things when the astrology is supporting it rather than kind of pulling you back. For example, there, the moon goes through something called a void of course. And a void of course is basically when it's like moving from something to the next, not really doing much at all. It moves signs every 2.5 days. So when it's going through a void of course, a lot of times we also kind of feel void of course, like we're not able to get stuff done. We kind of want to take a nap. We kind of want to go slow. Hmm. So I feel like just understanding this, understanding the way the astrology is playing out and having someone reflect to you how it's playing out with your life in particular, it allows a permission slip. And I'll give you a very brief story. For a lot of my life, I thought that I wasn't a creative. I thought that I wasn't artistic. I thought that I wasn't capable of making art. Until I started studying my chart more and more. And I realized that my chart actually has such big characteristics of being an artist, of being a creative. And so my chart has become my permission slip to write poems, to practice astrology as my career, to read tarot, to live life in a magical way. So that's what I feel like. Knowing the astrology allows you a permission slip and also a map so that when you're going out to create something, you're doing it at the right time rather than you know, hitting a wall and then thinking it's your fault. It's not your fault. There is just something up with the energy at the moment. So would you say to some degree, it's what a psychiatrist or a psychologist would do in terms of providing counseling, but this is with or guided by someone's astrological birth chart? I would say that if somebody needs help and needs therapy, then they definitely should go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. This is a good add-on. It is pretty similar, I want to say, to psychology, just because the way these archetypes came to be is based on research. They studied, oh, what, how are all these people that were born in this time? And how are all these people that were born on this time? And it's all based on research. So it's actually also a science. But then 
I would say that somebody studying astrology, well, may or may not have studied as long as a psychologist, you know? So it is not therapy, but I think it's great to aid therapy. Or if you don't need it, or if you don't feel that you need therapy, it's a great way to just understand yourself better and add some magic to life. You know, it just, it just adds like this, this sparkle for me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Definitely. It's very interesting too, because since you've taken this more seriously and since you've really gone deep into studying what astrology is about and how it can impact everyone's daily lives, there have been moments where you give me certain facts with my daily tasks and with my daily surroundings, which when I connect the dots, it just makes a lot of sense with regards to me in particular and how I approach things and there are different ways to describe how someone mentally, even spiritually, go about their everyday lives, right? Like there are days where I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling super duper motivated. Like, okay, I want to do like 10 things on my to-do list. I have my coffee, I have my breakfast, I'm ready to go out, I'm ready to work, and I'm ready to get shit done. But then there are also days where my routine is exactly the same. I go to bed the same night as I did before. I eat the same thing as I did before. I wake up, I have my coffee the same way, I have my breakfast the same way. But rather than saying, oh, I'm ready to get this, 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 this is done. I'm just like, oh, you know what? Today, I, I kind of just want to lay back. I want to put my feet up. I want to watch my favorite shows. I want to unwind. And there are different ways to validate or justify that. There, there are reasons such as, okay, I'm having a mental break. I am burnt out. Physically, I'm tired. I don't have motivation. And some people even might go as far as the question, okay, am I in the right career field? Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing what I actually want to do? And then it becomes an existentialist crisis, right? It like goes very fast. And not to say that astrology, particularly reading birth charts, provides the answers to everything to maybe fix finding a solution to that particular concern that some people might have but in certain situations and from my own experience I would say it can help in providing perspective and ultimately I at least for me from my vantage point you know we're not working closely with you but seeing how you work with it I feel astrology provides an added layer of perspective that could be beneficial. Now, it's not always going to be the solution to everything and nothing really is the solution to everything, right? But that added layer of perspective, maybe not for all, but for a certain set of people, it could provide clarity and a resource that could aid them along the way. Am I right in what I said? Absolutely. I definitely think it's a resource and... I'm just feeling into it and I'm thinking about, you know, (laughs) we know, or it's, it's a fact actually, that during the full moon, we're all at our like highest energy. We're all feeling a lot of energy to the point that it, this is a fact, someone in the LA police department said that they hire more police on full moons because there are more accidents and more things going on on the full moon. So if the full moon works in such a big way, then the new moon also works in a big way. And we're never really told about the new moon. We're usually told about the full moon because that's when we see the full moon in the sky. But actually, if we start tracking the moon, the moon has a cycle. It has a 29-day cycle. So it starts with a new moon. It, um, you know, it reaches its peak at the full moon. And then again, it goes back to a new moon. Through this process, through the 29 days, it moves through every sign. And it takes 2.5 days to move through a sign. So from my understanding, every time it moves a sign, or even from my lived experience for the last three years and the times that I've told you as well, because now we even have a board in our kitchen that says where the sun is and where (laughs) the moon is, because every 2.5 days, it kind of brings us this shift in perspective. Because if you think of the sun as like, the brightness, the warmth, the vitality. Think of the moon as a satellite that's kind of uh, channeling back what the sun is kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if it's moving every 2.5 days, then maybe say you're moving through, first of all, you're moving through your first house, which is Capricorn. So because you're moving, the moon is moving through your first house, you are ready to show up. You're ready to kind of be seen by the world. But say the moon was moving through your 12th house, which is Sagittarius. Um, the 12th house is the house of the unseen. So maybe you don't want to show up. Maybe you don't want to be seen on camera, you know? So that's the way I understand it because that way we're not blaming ourselves. And ultimately my goal in using astrology is for us to become more conscious, for us to become more compassionate with ourselves. And again, for us to give ourselves permission slips to be authentic and to be who we really are. So when we understand, oh, the energy of the day, because say the moon is in today, where's the moon right now? It's in Leo. So the energy of the day is really like bubbly, energetic. It's a fire sign. So maybe you want to go out. Maybe you want to hang out with friends. Maybe you want to go get a drink. Maybe you want to, you know, do something exciting. Whereas if the moon is in cancer, then maybe you want to lay low. You want to stay in your pajamas. You want to stay <laughs> under the sheet. Right. Um, so I feel it just gives a bit of, like you said, perspective and everything, you know, can give perspective if we're open to it. But I think it's just that we're not informed enough. So a lot of people just don't know um, the potential. Agree. Okay, so before I let you go here, two things. One, give us an idea of what the astrology says for the rest of the year, 2023, and tell people where they could find your work, what work services you provide, and any other important information that you think can come in handy. Thank you. So the astrology for the next, uh, for the rest of the year, rather, I'm just going to talk about the astrology for the rest of October, because that's already pretty big in itself. And for the rest of October, we have actually just entered eclipse season. And eclipse season is right around the time when we're about to experience eclipses. And eclipses are like new moons and full moons on steroids. They're like really like very amplified energy. So we're going to have a solar eclipse the middle of this month in Libra. And then we're going to have a lunar eclipse in Taurus at the end of the month. And solar eclipses, again, because it's a new moon, it's like a new beginning. And so it's a new beginning that you're really able to create or step into something that you have wanted to, but it's with the South node. So this is going a bit deeper, but it's really an invitation to look into your relationships. Look at the people you're surrounding yourself with. Are they allowing you to reach these capabilities that you dream of reaching? And then when we're moving towards the lunar eclipse, that's a big time of release. Like think of vacuum energy allowing you to surrender and release everything that hasn't been working for you. Um, and the thing is, sometimes these eclipses, like they bring energies that we didn't even know we needed. So like maybe we're being called to release something in our mind. We're actually like, oh, this is what I, what I want to release. But then something happens on the eclipse and something else is being released. That's what happens in eclipses. Like it's just really fast energy where the universe is helping you either release things or create new things. So it's big, big energy this month. Astrologers say do not um, manifest on these moons. Um, but I just think that if you know exactly what you want, go for it. But it's just really fast moving energy. So that's the rest of October. Yeah. Yeah. Go for and then it. <laughs> where you can find me is um, at Karina the Hardest. That is H-E-A-R-T-I-S-T, -E um, Hardest, on Instagram. Um, my services include astrology and aura analyses and tarot. I'm also a certified Zumba instructor and an embodiment coach. So I can do a lot of things. Um, I like to pull tools together to be able to create, you know, kind of bespoke sessions um, just for you. So yeah, send me a message. I'll have my services out on my page soon. But until then, definitely DM me. Yeah, and we can work something out. I'd be so happy to help anybody learn more about their astrology or bring more tarot into your life or just bring a little bit more magic and love and art. Oh, okay, very interesting. So what we're going to do one time 
is when we get closer to the UAP final four, I'm going to ask you to do a tarot pool to determine who's going to be the UAP champion. Oh, <laughs> oh, I won't do that. <laughs> I will, oh, we can pull, we can pull, but we can leave it up to people's imagination. So okay, I won't say exactly to, which to school. Provide perspective on okay, how okay. it's going to play out. Okay, sure. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I like having you around. You're you're quite a sight for sore eyes. Safe to say. <laughs> and I will be seeing you momentarily all right <laughs> thank you though for enlightening us with astrology thank you for being my first guest to talk about something out of the ordinary that i like to talk about and for those who listen to this podcast or watched it do check out karina's instagram account which she mentioned karina the hardest and see if astrology may be able to provide you the perspective that you need with certain not just challenges, but just certain adventures in life. And I also want to thank this time, take this time rather, to thank all the listeners of the podcast. We reached 100 episodes in our last episode. This is 101. So you could say this is the start of like the second phase of the podcast, which actually makes this part of the pod where I discuss astrology with you quite interesting. And yeah, I just want to thank everybody who has listened to the podcast who have given me compliments about certain episodes, certain guests. I'm sure many will also compliment me about having you as a guest for this episode. Those who have come up to me at the UAP Games or at events to tell me that they enjoy my podcast or any coverage. I just want to say I appreciate all of you for doing that. I want to shout out our sponsors of the podcast, The Cleaning Coach, Green Blooded, Get Blued, Varsity Lifestyle Co. And also want to mention if anyone wants to partner up, just message me and let's see what we can do. Karina, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining me, but thanks for joining the podcast today. I appreciate it. More power to you and can't wait to see what else you've got in store. Till then, see you all later, guys.